Hello and welcome to Tatvadeep, Conversations and Explorations. For our first episode on sociology, we sat down with Professor Indira Ramarao. Professor Ramarao was formerly Professor and Chairperson of the Department of Sociology and Director of the International Centre at the University of Mysore. She is currently a visiting Professor at the School of Social Sciences, MSMIA University of Applied Sciences, Bangalore, and holds an adjunct faculty position at the STM Institute of Management Development, Mysore. During her 42-year service at the University of Mysore, Dr. Ramarao held such positions as Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Honorary Director of the Centre of Women's Studies, Member of University Syndicate, Academic Council and IQAC, besides serving NAAC in different capacities. She has recently been conferred the Lifetime Distinguished Award by the Indian Sociological Society. We talked about the essence of the discipline of sociology, new ways of looking that it can bring to other disciplines like economics, medicine, technology, to name a few, sociological interpretation, the history of sociology in India, how sociologists should test their ideas out in the real world and how they can interact with the communities and people they work with. How sociologists can contribute to art and new communities that are coming up in the world and the practical importance of research. We hope this conversation can help the listeners see the tattva or the true essence of sociology and its potential to help us understand our society and change it for the better for each and every one of us. Hello, Professor Indra Ramarao. Thank you for taking your time out to be on Tatwadi. Hello, and, thank you, and thank you for this opportunity. And uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Sociology is uh, a wonderful subject, and uh, it is so close to us, so close to our existence. We, uh, in a way, it is the human response to uh, the external elements. That's how I see exactly. sociology. Yeah, yeah uh, exactly. Yeah, and uh, so I'm looking forward to this conversation. Let me start asking, uh, start with the, this, this first question, which is uh, uh, your understanding of sociology. Uh, how do you approach the subject with some, some case studies? So we can start from there. Okay. So sociology is basically about people. It is about the society in which we live. And I believe that uh, sociology is not just theoretical knowledge, but it is a practice. That's the track that I follow. Because as a teacher for, yeah, I should say half a century, 50 years. Wow. I'm also happy to share with you that tomorrow, August 10th, I complete 50 years of my wow. journey. Wow, as congratulations. A Congratulations. Uh, thank Madam. you. Thank you. Uh, because I joined this uh, profession uh, as a teacher of sociology on August 10th, 1972, when I was just a 20 year old. Wow. And uh, it, this has been a passion for me. Of course, I must confess that in the beginning, you know, for at least about uh, 15, 20 years, a lot of my concentration was on reading, teaching, conveying. Uh, to my students, the essence of the subject, because we all have a curriculum to follow. And so the concentration was more on uh, delivering uh, to students the essence of those contents. And then, you know, I started thinking, I said, what is sociology about if you're just talking about it in the classroom? Then I realized that there is more sociology outside the classroom than within the classroom. And that was also the time when I started working in projects, research projects, you know, working with uh, women, working with tribal communities. And my entry into the, what I call the action sociology started with uh, my joining the women's movement. Because as a student of sociology, one issue that bothered me was inequality inequalities of various kinds, you know, right? Because as a youngster, you have different kinds of dreams and fascinations. And, but as you start growing up in the discipline, you see that the whole notion of equality is more on paper than in practice. And of course, we have equality conferred on us, 
And I remember my teacher once telling me there is, yes, equality of opportunity for all of us. And this is the greatest thing that the Constitution of India has done. However, in the utilization of those equal opportunities, there is no equality. So he said, start thinking about that. Why? Why is it that uh, some people always, you know, get opportunities that others don't have? And there is this, uh, you know, cliche about, okay, if they're not using the equal opportunity, they are incapable, they are not interested, they don't want to work hard, etc. Then, you know, I read somewhere this one sentence that always haunts me, you know, uh, which said, the race for equality is never run among equals. It's always run among those who are not equals. So this uh, writer went on to give an example. He said, if you're looking at a race, a running race, stand at a distance, you'll see lots of people, you know, they're there on a line waiting for the whistle to blow. And for an out outsider, somebody who doesn't go close and see people who are sitting there, he, he or she or anybody for that matter would think that whoever runs first or whoever, you know, goes fast would win the race. Then the writer said, when I went close, I saw that not all people who were sitting on this line had equal cap capacities. There were those who were able-bodied, there were, there were those who were, looked very healthy, but there were also others, you know, who did not look uh, healthy. There were sick people. He takes that example. And there were those who were disabled. So I suddenly realized that this is not going to be a race among equals. So naturally, those who have those advantages will reach the goal first. And so this, you know, sentence uh, went into my mind. And I think I started thinking as a teacher of sociology or as a student of sociology, and I still consider myself a student, because I always say, you know, that sociology is like a huge ocean. And I, with all my uh, uh, experience of uh, 50 years, I'm still standing on the banks mm -hmm. and I don't think I can swim because it's so much the way that discipline has been growing and the new ideas that are coming in, uh, you always find that there is something you don't know, you still have to learn. So this inequality bothered me. And of all the forms of inequality based on caste, based on location, based on class, uh, there's one form of inequality that cuts across all these and that I thought is gender. And we also in the 1980s, you know, had uh, the autonomous women's movement very active. And this gender uh, induced inequalities always bothered me, but then I didn't know how to address that issue. So when the women's group called Samata was formed in Mysore and there was some issue, you know, I saw all my friends, of course I knew many of them, were on, in the campus protesting, I realized that, well, here is my opportunity to give a shape to all those random thoughts that I used to get about inequality per se. And so from then onwards, I realized that it is very important to be a part of an action group. And sociology, besides you know, gender inequalities, addresses many other issues, I know. So for me, sociology is about understanding people, knowing about them, and more than anything else, applying what you have learned in the classroom. I should say that there are various subjects that we study. And since the time I started teaching up to now, the discipline has become so diverse and has included several other areas. And so I started thinking that it should be action sociology. It should be what you know, today we call public sociology. To me, sociology is uh, in the public domain because nowadays we have started questioning that. I know there was a time when you know many of the sociologists did not write in media, did not speak about it in uh, certain public platforms. They said, no, 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 I'm an academician. And there is also this big divide between sociology and social work. Actually, 
I must say that uh, all most of the departments of social social work were started by departments of sociology. But somewhere, you know, down the line, we start, they started saying, we are professional, you are non-professional. Because they work with people, they are in the field. And so I say, no, I don't agree with that. Because I believe that social work is not one of degree only. It's a matter of attitude, your desire, your passion to work. So coming back to what I was saying, sociology is engagement with people. Is that, that's how I look at it first. The second thing is you can't be a good sociologist unless you become what I call a people's person. I'm happy only when I'm in the midst of people that may be students, that may be uh, gr you know, groups with uh, which I'm interacting, whom I'm studying, whom I'm trying to convey something. So uh, the first thing, as I said, is it's about people and it's engaging with people. So you have to have an open mind and you can't really go into sociology with uh, closed mindsets. You have to be open because there will be many surprises for us. Many times, you know, if you are uh, caught in a theoretical, uh, not that I'm, um, you know, trivializing or disrespecting theory, but then if you're caught in a certain uh, mental block, as I call it, you refuse to acknowledge other points of view. And society is constantly changing. So there are always areas which uh, you have not been explored. There are always interpretations. So you must be a very open person who's ready to accept even those points of view that may not be in conformity what, with what you think is right. Always, you know, we go to the field also because sociology, I come to that just a little later. So I realized that we need not get caught in certain theoretical um, blocks, as I call it, and refuse to recognize the contributions of others. And so the other thing is sociology must recognize that we don't live in a world that is homogenous. We live in a heterogeneous, diverse society. And uh, generally, if you look at the way knowledge has been constructed, knowledge has been interpreted, it doesn't take into cognizance the views or lives or uh, styles or uh, what should I call lived experiences of those groups who are not visible. That's how in understanding sociology, concepts like marginality, vulnerability, they become very important. See, there are always people who are visible and there are many who are not visible. Some completely invisible, others standing on the margins. So a good sociologist, according to me, is also one who sees that there are diverse groups. You know, one of the words that we sociologists use very often in our discourses is culture. Not, not, not just sociologists, you know how culture now is being discussed, culture is being interpreted. But if you come to look at it closely, I think we must ask the question, whose culture are we talking about? Is it the culture of the upper class, the upper caste? Uh, those who, you know, who have control over society's resources, those who are able to direct the course of events, either because of their power or because of their uh, status or because they have been able to garner, you know, a lot of advantages. So I see that the interpretation of culture is one of the areas where sociological discourses must not follow any beaten track, but go with a very open mind. And so there is also another word, you know, called subculture. So whose culture are you talking about is a question which a sociologist must ask when they say, this is not our culture. Which culture? Whose culture? And culture is uh, an area which is constantly changing. And I've also seen that culture is often interpreted by people to suit their own, um, you know, points of view, or when you take a stand or don't take a stand on this uh, whole issue of culture, suddenly you realize that uh, people are, you know, are not coming forth openly. So that's another word, whatever the subject may be that you're talking about in sociology, culture, 
marginality, tribal, women, Dalit, um, disability, the LGBTQ issues. We must be very, very clear that we go with an open mind and always be prepared to learn. And I want to also say that sociology is just not about learning, but it is also about unlearning. Mm -hmm. Unlearning many of those uh, stereotypical notions that we have about society. So for me, sociology is a people's subject. It's a practice, not just a theory. It's also not just about learning, but it is about unlearning. And another thing is sociology, you have to be a very sensitive uh, person who tries to ask questions. See, we people, I think, uh, play a very important uh, role in this society because we, because of our training, because of our uh, reading, mm -hmm. because of the kind of sociological knowledge that has been uh, stored over uh, several decades, we have to first ask a question. A good sociologist is always one who is asking questions. For me, when I see something, you know, when people are walking in the street, when they are uh, sitting in a railway station or an airport or a bus stand, or you know, when you just see people, groups, you should ha have many questions that come up in your mind. That is what sociology is about. Why this? Why are these people behaving like this? Why are they sitting like this? You know, there are several questions. That's why I like to learn sociology by uh, sitting in uh, different places, like um, maybe a market, maybe a bus stop, maybe a train station. That's why I always tell my students, see, life is not just about traveling only in AC compartments or comfortable positions. I always give them the example of a train, you know, called push-pull. Mm -hmm. It's called push-pull, which goes from Mysore to Bangalore. It has mm -hmm. about 18 plus stops. Hmm. And a large number of people who travel by that train are uh, those who work in um, maybe garment industry and several other uh, uh, places. And they get into the train somewhere, get off. Up. They, not everybody travels right up to Bangalore, but it's one of the most inexpensive trains. So I say if you want to learn in sociology, if you want to understand Indian society, if you want to understand the different uh, ways in which people live their lives, travel by that train. That, that will teach you better sociology than me talking about inequality, access, life's problems, et cetera, in the class too. So it's about the field uh, where you go, you see, you talk, you listen. And as I said, when you are in the field, now next I'm coming to the other point where sociology to me, as I have already said, is not just about classroom learning. It is about learning outside. And that is what we call as the field. Hmm. Generally, you know, there is a mistaken notion that it's only anthropologists who are in the field. Hmm. Uh, but no, I don't think there can be sociology without the field. And by when I say field, it has a very broad meaning. It means the, the world outside, your comfort zones where most of us uh, seem to live and we are always complaining. Mm -hmm. And to know what is it that you have that there are hundreds and thousands and lakhs and crores of people who don't even have that, you visit the field. Then only you understand sociology. So the field is very close to my heart. And a, a sociologist, both for learning and unlearning, has to be with the field, has to be in the field, has to talk to people. As I, and I also said, listen, because a lot of uh, um, writings and uh, work, you know, somehow ignores what I call the narrative mode. We, we, many times, you know, when I get angry also with my students because they write, write, I said, come on, don't tell stories, you know, enough. Come and talk straight to the point, especially PhD pieces and all that. But then I also realized that stories are important. Mm -hmm. You have to listen to people. So in sociology, I believe what I call as alternative discourse. 
the mm. alternative paradigms you know like the alternative models where you listen to people and the language you know as you we were talking initially you talked about this see i read uh, you know one of these writers is it, is it esoteric language that we use or the language that people understand i write a lot in kannada which is you know my, uh, my mother tongue and uh, uh, today i must tell you that in most of the social science disciplines at all levels whether it is plus 2 or undergrad or uh, post graduation and also phd Hmm. Mm, at least 90% of the teaching learning and research work goes on in canada and karnataka wow and so i yeah and it's also happening in many other parts of the country you know hmm. so i think that it is important to write in in your language to bring hmm. your discipline to the public domain this is what i call public sociology and if nobody is understanding what you are talking or writing what's the purpose after all we have i consider this is a great opportunity to for me to have you know uh, this education um, that i desired my father was a professor of english in the university so i always wanted to be a teacher and i'm very happy that i got that opportunity uh, because i always you know saw him surrounded by his students but he wrote a lot of uh, many of his writings were in kannada mm. i remember he, him telling you know though he was a very well respected teacher and uh, wrote a lot in english he said but if i don't write in english i don't lose anything but if i don't write in kannada i feel i lose so he has written a lot in kannada so that was my inspiration and i started writing so i don't i heard once you know somebody say oh, how um, beautifully this person spoke you know such a great scholar we didn't understand anything that he said <laughs> i think i don't i don't think that's the model if somebody says i don't understand what you're talking uh, i don't know whether that is a model we should follow so i started writing in canada reaching out and maybe i don't know whether i should speak about it a little later the way i started writing my columns and that was an opportunity for me to bring sociology to the public uh, domain so coming back to what i was saying i said sociology is also again about reaching to the people initially you know it was thought as an exclusively classroom subject and if at all we talked about the field you know i remember Uh, the comments that would come are why you people talking about the field you have social workers to do that you have so- anthropologists who will go to the field and for them the field meant only tribal communities so you uh, know simple societies but no i don't think we should limit the borders of any discipline for that matter and one of the greatest uh, sources of uh, satisfaction for me today is that sociology now has made inroads into all disciplines when i when we introduced an elective paper called medical sociology then we have now changed the nomenclature and we call it sociology of health and well being we had people who came to our department because my sir uh, our university department was one of the first in this country the first if i remember correctly is bangalore university and then we took a cue from them introduced this in our department so people came said what are you people doing with medicine do you think you are doctors are you trying to teach that he said no we are talking about health as an issue that has to be understood from a socio political economic cultural perspective and then we changed the nomenclature and today it's offered in most of the departments with this title sociology of health and well being so health is not just about freedom from disease we are supposed to ask this question who is sick and who is not sick what is health basically who gets access to good health care safe health care and what is the impact of uh, privatization of the medical sector on different groups of people and we know now that uh, there is with social spending on health and education you know being reduced you have uh, people spending a lot of money and we call it this out of pocket expenditure 
on these issues. So take any sector today, health, uh, technology, law, we are asking sociological questions. And I think that is where we have become very relevant and our disciplines borders are open. And many other disciplines also have now opened their borders for sociologists to come in and tell them certain home truths which they did not realize till then. Great. I was just before close, you know, I stopped this sector. I must say, I was recently talking to a group of uh, teachers of uh, engineering colleges, you know, on uh, uh, inclusion. That's another concept we are using. So why is it necessary to include people? You know, it's a technological education is not just about uh, um, transferring uh, knowledge about different branches of technology. You have to ask certain questions. And I was happy at the end when they said, you know, thank you so much because we never even thought of these things. Mm -hmm. we, we only thought that our world mm -hmm. was about science, technology, engineering, skills. But the kind of questions you raised have now opened our eyes to many other issues, which till today were never even considered important for us. So I think sociology does that. It has that immense capacity to critically look at what is going on in this world around us. You covered a lot of uh, ground. You spoke mm. about a lot of things, which we will, we will go in, uh, into the details of it as we progress. No uh, mm. I actually wanted to talk, uh, ask you about this sociology having an impact on uh, other, other disciplines like economy and medicine, uh, equality. So when you talk about, in fact, our society, Indian society has changed so much, like in the past, we had very clear so social distinctions. And now things have changed. We have people from one community doing another profession, you know, a different profession, which yeah. they never had never had an opportunity or never had to do. It, it never bothered, them. like, for example, a carpenter was always a carpenter. A barber was always a barber. A teacher was always a teacher. Now a teacher's child would become a doctor. A doctor's child would become a pilot and uh, so on and so forth. So how do you see these things? This, this clash, one is how this clash uh, is changing the world for the sociologists mm -hmm. and how, do, where do you draw the line? Yeah, okay. Thank you. So let me uh, start with the first very important question. You sociology, you know, uh, make inroads into other disciplines. If I, you know, I hope I'm saying it the right way because you gave the example of economics, medicine, etc. Yes. I think I have already given the kind of background yes. uh, to the answer that I would give for this question. Sociology, you know, as I said, raises certain questions which otherwise are not asked in certain areas. See, let, let's just now come to this question about growth and development, you know, to draw a distinction between growth and development. Well, growth is about quantitative uh, data. It's, of course, I'm not undermining the, I'm sorry, I'm undermining the importance of quantitative uh, data at all, you know, like, okay, in 1950, so many schools, in 1970, it increased in 1990, and then again, today, 2022, uh, this is the situation. But sociology comes into the picture, and where as a sociologist, you are supposed to ask, fine, the growth has taken place. Yes, numbers are not unimportant, but what is the pattern of this growth? Mm. Who are the people who have benefited from this growth? Where, where has this growth taken place? Is it in rural areas? Is it in urban areas? Or who are the groups of people who are benefiting by this kind of growth. So sociology looks brings into the whole discourse on development. You see, now we shifted from growth to development. Development is about, uh, to me as a sociologist, equal distribution of opportunities to make use of that growth. 
This is a question which I, as a student of sociology, am supposed to ask. That is where we come into the picture. So you can't measure everything in terms of quantitative data because there is a feeling, you know, that if you are not working with a machine, that if you are talking, if you are only writing, if you are asking questions, you well are not considered that important. You see, in the hierarchy of disciplines. you see that sociology has never been on the top mm-hmm. often sociological uh, explanations are not even invited i the, mm-hmm. the most recent example i can give you is that in uh, all many of the committees that have been constituted uh, for uh, making recommendations for rebuilding lives and livelihoods after covid you don't find sociologists there at all we are actually mm-hmm. talking about it because they think there are, there are people i'm not showing disrespect to anybody but then you have an economic interpretation you have a management interpretation you have a csr interpretation you have all those things but where are the sociologists but i think sociology is necessary it comes into the picture when certain questions about inclusion mm-hmm. who gets to benefit have all the people been included even if it is policy interpretation or you know talking about all those economic uh, uh, the growth that has taken place you are talking about rise in per capita income rise in all kinds of uh, things that are happening in the recent past we are we are happy and proud about it but those critical questions about the pattern of distribution of development opportunities who benefits who does not why people on the margins never come into uh, the you know center we always have to you know center and the periphery or the margin for me as a student of sociology development takes place change which is a very critical area for sociologists to analyze and interpret happens only when the people in the margins the people in the periphery the people who have completely been ignored by all these development uh, exercise that has been taking place are brought in so when inequalities are reduced mm-hmm. not completely eliminated yes it probably it will take hundreds of years because new forms of inequalities are now coming up mm-hmm. but at least minimum requirements and even in defining minimum requirements i think sociological interpretation is necessary you say mm-hmm. you know when i was a student i remember we taught food clothing shelter but mm-hmm. now no mm-hmm. questions such as what kind of food what kind of clothing what kind of shelter this is where sociology comes into economics to yeah. ask questions to ask these questions i am not saying a 20 course meal for everybody is necessary but then do we at least get access to nutritious food do we have the choice i think sociological interpretation brings into focus the question of choice so sociological questions are about the choices that people have mm-hmm. now you also uh, you know gave uh, uh, the example of medicine where does sociology come into medicine as i said health for example i would look at it as um, you know health which is a broader concept so who gets access to medicine itself is a question we have to ask mm-hmm. and then health is also about uh, a status of being healthy mm-hmm. how why certain uh, occupations for example see occupations and health in general itself needs to be looked at from a group angle from a gender angle from a location angle and all these questions are asked by sociologists it's see if i live in a comfortable house with a lot of air and light etc i am free from certain diseases mm. but uh, what what about people who don't have access to those um, minimum requirements so coming back to what i was saying the whole uh, definition and interpretation of minimum requirements the line that we draw between necessity and amenity itself is a sociological issue according to me what is a necessity and necessity for uh, whom you know people say okay two morsels of food and 
you know, some clothes to wear and a, a roof to stay under. But I think these are very, very narrow interpretations which are driven by a culture which uh, reinforces hierarchies that are already there in our society. I was... So I was uh, so one thing that came. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, when you were yeah, talking no, about no, this please. medicine thing, I I, I yeah. noticed something. We were uh, when we we were living in a village, and uh, okay. uh, people were working on these farms. And uh, yeah. whenever they fell sick, like if uh, if we have cold or fever, we, mm. we wait for a couple of days. Like usually, yeah. we wait and we change our food we eat little we eat certain foods that we eat to have maybe we would have pepper rasam or something to okay. uh, mm. like that but these people they rush immediately to the doctor take medicines no. and take an injection because they cannot afford to wait because they they earn every day so they have to go mm. go to work every day so that is one thing that comes to my mind when you're talking about this particular section they don't have the freedom to uh, treat them naturally treat themselves naturally yeah. So that that comes exactly that is what i meant when i said choice do they yeah, have they the choice yeah. to wait or do mm. they have the choice to uh, i uh, if i may use the word experiment with uh, certain uh, alternate forms of uh, getting the uh, you know feeling better now i give you uh, one quick example of uh, forest dependent communities mm. you know there is this whole process of relocation of forest dependent communities from national parks that is on now that's mm. an area where i have been working so yes whether they had the choice or whether they called it voluntary because a lot of relocation uh, uh, you know, um, what should I say, projects are using the word voluntary relocation. Okay, let's take it that they cannot live in that, uh, you know, forest anymore. And you can't have human habitations there because of growing human animal conflict, no access to schools, no access to electricity, no access to uh, many other uh, <clears throat> necessities, which we think are important. Okay, so they have been relocated. And now you're looking at relocation only from what they say positive impact. But I understand that one of the negative impacts of this has been the loss of access to traditional sources of health care because they have been moved from the forest. So when they were in the forest area, they had access to certain, uh, you know, those traditional uh, healing practices, as well as they, they could take from the environment. Mm. Now mm. that they have been moved out of the forest, mm. as you know, the same thing is happening. They, are, they have to depend on uh, public health care uh, facilities. Many of them have now started going to private hospitals mm. where they have to spend money. Mm. And... Uh, not everybody can afford that, but they have to go because they have no other access. Oh, yeah. So uh, that's why I said sociolo sociology comes into the picture and these questions that you have raised have to be asked. <clears throat> why is it that I can make my choices? Why is it that others don't have that choice? Why is it that I don't travel in a bus on which there are 40 people sitting on the roof and uh, 60 people inside? Somebody, you know, who can afford mm. to travel in safe circumstances can definitely, oh, these people, you know, they do all this. But do they have the choice? The unequal distribution of resources, healthcare, education, uh, <clears throat> infrastructure, name anything is something that sociology has to, has to address and that you can do only when you start you know um, understanding the and experiencing the lived in experiences of different groups of people so sociological interpretation comes when not only just asking questions but there are new ways you see the i'll just give you a quick example of this cycle scheme you know which was very popular in tamil nadu and now it has been introduced in many other parts of the country see the cycle you don't look at the cycle only as uh, a tool which uh, brought young 
especially you know look at it from a gender angle i'm trying to look at it from a gender angle where which brought girls to the school but one more thing that happened was when these girls i have seen in many parts especially in tamil nadu i've seen this women 40 plus 50 plus riding uh, those uh, bicycles mm. so when the granddaughter or the daughter brought the cycle home left it there these women started taking them out and yeah. for them it became a change agency as we call it yeah. it be, it made them mobile it got yeah. them connected to the world outside so they saw that there was a world outside so it opened up markets it opened up opportunities for either uh, skill acquisition or uh, you know um, enhancing the skills they already had kind of it opened up a new world for them so i think that any policy any change whatever the subject may be technology a road is not just a technological innovation for a sociologist a road has many many meanings yes. a road as connectivity a road as opening up for avenues for change so <clears throat> whether it's medicine whether it's technology whether it is economics or whether it is uh, policy or whether it is law whether it is uh, you know name any subject today yes, sociologists yes. can play their part because as i said they bring a new face yeah to that discipline and to both to uh, the uh, academic uh, side of it and the practice side of it this is my feeling and you have said that sociology has traversed 100 years in this country in one of your uh, mm -hmm. in, yeah more yeah. than 100 yes, years yes and yes yes it because many departments go the mumbai department has already done it yeah. and soon the lucknow department is doing and even in mysore we are not too far away far. from that yeah mm -hmm. and what what has been your uh, observation of what mm -hmm. is how what is that you can talk about these 100 years can you just capture these 100 years these changes any any highlights how what was your observation in these 100 years if you can talk about that how societies have changed okay. indian societies have changed yeah see uh, initially i think that the 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 i won't want to say the scope of the discipline was limited but there were certain subjects you know the the concentration was more on studying the structure of indian society mm -hmm. the village caste Uh, and, and the number of uh, if i can use that word areas that sociology covered in the mm -hmm. initial stages of its uh, <clears throat> introduction sorry into the academic world were limited mm -hmm. so yeah like i said it, it the concentration was more on structure of course there were also discussions of change Mm -hmm. there are social change in different groups that was one area where sociology started uh, uh, looking into but after that there was a time when questions started being raised again you know like i have been talking a lot about who sociology are we talking about sociology for whom sociology of what groups and isn't it necessary to come out of that structure framework and go into micro areas or engage in micro studies where you are looking at different groups look at sociological theory sociological practice from the perspective of different groups as i said tribe dalit women and uh, all those divisions that we find in society you know bring it into the framework of sociology this is what started happening you know 90s like 2000 and onwards so initially in the i would say first 3 uh, 4 uh, decades of its uh, existence it was traversing it started in mumbai and then lucknow uh, then mysore also in fact mysore uh, offered the first undergraduate program in uh, sociology in the country the first uh, 
uh, attempt to bring sociology into the academic world in this university itself happened way back in uh, uh, 1918, you know, but it then was part of philosophy department. Mm -hmm. So initially sociological understanding was about studying the theoretical contributions of uh, well-known sociologists. And I would say mostly drawn from the West. Mm. See, one change that I notice now is that the question that started being asked to us, why is sociological thinking dominated by the West? Mm. Initially, it was all about, I'm not saying that the contributions of our founders to be ignored, like maybe August Com, the Emile Durkheim, Max Weber, etc. And Karl Marx, of course, has dominated uh, our thinking for you know, ever, because I think his contributions are very important because they first focused on inequalities. And he asked questions which uh, set us thinking about why, you know, there is this inequality in distribution of resources, power being associated with the control of the means of production, etc. that he talked about. So from there, you know, today we are asking uh, questions about why only this Western perspective and the male perspective? Mm. You see, why are you looking at sociology only from the perspective of Western scholars and the men? I would say this. You see, for example, if I can give you a quick example, August Comte is known as the founding uh, founder of sociology. His student, Harriet Martineau, about whom, let me tell you very honestly, there are many people who have not even heard of her name. But Harriet Martineau, you know, she wrote in English, she brought into, uh, uh, you know, the main uh, sociological discourse, many questions which Comte himself had not brought. Mm -hmm. And I believe that he was so impressed by her writings that the essence of what he wrote or her writings, he made her translate into French and then that's how he read it. Mm -hmm. But then you don't recognize her as one of the founders. Mm -hmm. Or if at all you uh, talk about her, you say, who is the first woman sociologist? You are looking at women as women sociologists, Dalit sociologists, uh, tribal sociologists. And I think that that needs to be questioned. And the one change I notice in sociology is this hierarchy in society being brought into the, sociology, the academy of sociology is being questioned. And we're looking at alternate discourses. And there are ma many, many, uh, you know, uh, course uh, contents where you never found the contributions of sociologists from India. Hmm. So one change that I have noticed today is that at least not everywhere, let me be very honest with you, not everywhere, but we are, but at least those who are sensitive and who are conscious of this hierarchy entering into sociological academia have now started asking, interpret Indian society, interpret society itself from the perspective of groups that have been in the margins, sociologists from this country who have written about these things. And for sociology, you know, the, again, one more change that I notice is that you, there, there is this, what I, may I call it, I don't know, a completely theoretical discourse, heavy, strong writing, which was once considered as the only yes, source right. that we need to respect and recognize. But now, no, you have uh, literature, for example, if uh, I may say that, is a major uh, data source for us, but we never recognize that. We always, what have I got to learn from this discipline, that discipline, from that writing, this writing. That one change that I notice is those barriers are now breaking very gradually though. And sociology has now started looking at in these hundred year journey. Today, for example, you know, one of the, uh, we are having our state conference very soon, the Karnataka State Sociology. So I myself said, what is the topic? People were like coming up with subjects like environment, globalization, change, etc. I said, I'm not saying those subjects are not important. But let's now look at a new topic. Like I said, looking at COVID from a sociological perspective. 
the role of policy. What can sociology do? Let's talk about that. You know, let's tell this uh, world, at least whoever is there, whoever is going to listen, whoever is going to read our writings, what we can do. So today, initially, the I would say in the first uh, 50, 60 years, sociology as a theory was more in the you know, in, in the discourse, as well as in many of those academics, dialogues and writings and all that. Today, in the last uh, two decades, especially, we are talking of uh, sociology as a practice. That's one change that I noticed. Not everybody is doing that, because there are those who feel like you asked, to what extent can sociology interfere? I like that word because I say we should interfere. Because there are those initially, you know, this is another change. Initially, is, well, what do I have got uh, to do in um, going and solving problems? Mm -hmm. well, I just teach. Mm -hmm. I teach about a slump. I teach about uh, sex work. I teach about uh, the problems of different groups of people. And then my job is over. Because as a sociologist, it is not my job to go and interfere there, if I may use that, and I'll take that word from you. We have no role to play there, they said. You talk about it, you write, you create a theory, you discuss. But now the feeling is, no, we have to be practitioners, we have to intervene. You have to talk about it, you have to bring that into public domain. Uh, you discuss it, you make your, you alter your discourse. Don't feel bad if you are not using theory. And in the beginning, you know, when we were talking, you said, I, there are jargons. There are words which you people can't understand. So now we say, what's the problem in using simple language? What is the problem in writing in your language? What is the problem in doing micro studies? Today, you say in sociology, the thrust is now slowly shifting to micro studies. When a macro level analysis is necessary, a theory which will ex which was created to explain a particular phenomenon from a global perspective. But that will not explain everything today because mm. there are micro realities mm. based on group, based on caste, based on gender, based on uh, sexual orientation, based on uh, physical condition, based on where you live or where you don't live, based on what language you speak or what you don't speak, based on uh, your uh, cultures, etc. So today's sociology is now coming up with discourses on micro level realities. This is what I think is a change that has occurred in a big way. Yeah. So study small groups mm -hmm. and then come out with the viable solutions. You know, this is one big challenge for us. I'm uh, glad you raised this question because there are many people who are actually criticizing and attacking sociologists and saying they only talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I think that talking is also important. What kind of talk? Not sitting on the fence and then saying, you know, I'm not... Uh, uh, social social worker, I am not a uh, policy maker, I am not, you know, um, in the governance mechanism to be doing anything. No, I think that this is my belief as a student of sociology and having been in the profession for 50 years now, I have decided that at least you should talk about it. You should ask questions. Yesterday, I had students in my class asking me, you know, we have seen this happening. This is something, a gender uh, issue. What should we do about it? I said, the first thing you should do is talk about it. Ask the question. So I said, yes, ma'am, we have asked, but then, you know, no, we are not taken seriously. Mm -hmm. I said, that's okay. That Whether you're taken seriously or not, second. But the fact that you have raised a question, which otherwise was never asked, mm -hmm. is important. That is the first step of change. So I think that is where sociology's role becomes critical when you bring in perspectives which otherwise have not been raised so far. And today, I think in sociology, this is going on. 
actually yeah. the indian sociological society's uh, conference this time which is going to be held in meghalaya in december we'll discuss this theme you know 100 years of sociology we look at what has happened and what is our road map for the future this next uh, thing that we would like i would like we, i would like you to talk about is uh, writings the narratives because you are uh, you, you, that concerns you i mean uh, watching you watching your videos watching your talks uh, we understand that you are very very clear about changing the way things are written and that brings us to this thought of there are certain social uh, in our societies art plays a very big role in reinforcing certain beliefs yeah. uh, so how can sociologists work with say filmmakers or uh, writers yeah. and novelists there's one wonderful novel i don't know if you have read it it's called yeah. generations uh, it's a okay. tamil novel uh, by by a writer called neela patmanabhan uh, okay tamil tamil uh, has novel. it been translated into yes english? in english yeah it is hmm. it was translated by uh, a wonderful he, he was also the translator was also, also a sahitya academy winner um, it's called generations in english and talai muraigal in tamil and it was okay. written uh, i think it was written in the uh, 60s sometime and uh, it's a wonderful book about uh, inequality gender inequality mm. and how women mm. suffered mm. and definitely uh, it is like uh, when you read it you feel that you are reading a social study a time cap oh. you know mm. so mm-hmm. how can sociologists work with uh writers and artists especially mm-hmm. when you are when when you talk about so, uh, writing academic papers in a certain way and you are against uh writing it in a certain way you know, like with jargons and very theoretical and very uh detached from reality from the layman's perspective okay. so if mm-hmm. you can talk about how sociology can make inroads into people's uh, stories which people uh, consume like for example ads ads mm. will reinforce certain social thing and they, you know ads or movies uh, how they represent so- societies so mm. how can sociologists how they can change this these things or make an impact in the way people understand have a balanced view of society rather than having this a very narrow tunnel vision can you okay. talk about it yeah sure the first thing i would say uh, uh, vis-a-vis writing is that sociologists must first shed their complex if at all they have you know that uh, this is especially uh, in relation to the style of writing style language these are two things that i consider are very important so the question is whom are you reaching out to do i want to reach out to a academic audience only you know where my uh, quality and qualification are going to be decided only by the play, the journal or whatever the book where it is published is that my objective because when you talk of writing the first thing that i consider we must give credence to is what is the purpose whom are you trying to reach out two things the purpose is if you want to reach out only to an academic audience then okay use those sources where you know your writing is likely to be considered because it's very difficult you know uh, to be published in certain uh, well known refereed uh, journals i would be happy i will not be a hypocrite and say that i don't care where it is published i'll be very happy if it is published in certain journals in my discipline which have always you know been like iconic for us let me be very frank however you know that's not the end of it because i believe that decolonizing sociology that is the word that's now being used is also very important when you decolonize your discipline when you bring it out of that uh, you know maybe what i call ivory tower Mm-hmm. and bring it up the, uh, you know bring, bring it to people for whom it's meant you are choosing a people subject because basically the first thing i said is sociology is about people understanding people relating to their lives recording and documenting lived in experiences so if those people don't understand what you're writing 
or if you don't listen to them and bring into your writing their perspectives i think we we don't serve any purpose you are you are only reaching out to a limited audience who will read who will comment or who who will appreciate or maybe comments are definitely welcome so i would say that the language and the language of writing is also very important there was a time and perhaps even now there are circles where uh, this is happening where they say if you don't write in a certain style you know using theory using complicated words well your writing is considered ordinary mm. okay you know what is it after all it's not classy is the mm. word they mm. used and the discipline has grown so much i would tell you recently we published uh, um, you know english kannada translation equivalents in sociology where i was you know played the main role and it's being brought out by the national translation mission you know where and initially when the first work of that kind was done there were about 1000 words that were used it seems in sociological uh, uh, they called it uh, some trans uh, you know it's textbook authority of india Mm-hmm. but when i started getting into that work of course with my team i worked for 8 years mm-hmm. and now that publication has finally seen the light of the day there are 12000 concepts mm-hmm. but i don't think that is the ultimate because mm-hmm. we realize that as the discipline grows, grows yeah. new concepts get included and many of them you know like you were talking about literature etc have come from other disciplines because today you are talking about interdisciplinarity multidisciplinarity no longer is any word uh, you know your uh, domain domain only mm-hmm. you have to look at it from different perspectives and i wouldn't say that uh, this is the ultimate for it. one quick example that i can give you is this word called mcdonaldization which was never there when i was a student the whole uh, this is discussion around mcdonald's came much 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 later but so for a writer the challenge of course is to bring new concepts introduce new concepts and i don't understand why we always have to use a concept given by somebody to be recognized as authentic why not you bring in a concept yourself why have that complex you know a writer should never have a complex that because this concept has not been associated with somebody who is a big name in the profession in the discipline it's going to be discounted no i think that if you think that this word or concept that you are using is relevant is appropriate and is context specific you have the freedom to use it this is my stand so that's how i use so then coming back to the issue of uh, the style of writing well i think that if sociology has to have any role to play as i have already said a couple of times the first responsibility is to raise those issues which otherwise have not come into public discourse or public domain ask this question you know comment on those writings one need not be scared or feel bad to raise these questions so the first thing that i would do or i have tried to do is to bring into the public forum those issues which i think are very important and i must tell you also that in response to your question about interference i think that sociologists must react to all those incidents that are happening around oh. them and i'm oh. sorry that most of the times people don't do that they just keep quiet you know it's not my area you have journalists to for everything they say you have journalists to do that why as a as a person who is dealing with society why can't you talk about it i say so i feel that it is very important for a sociologist to respond to an incident that happens maybe wa- wa- violence of different sorts atrocities on different groups or a particular incident or use of a certain type of language maybe by a writer politician academician whoever it may be so i think that sociologists also need to have courage 
the courage how do you, how do you deal with this how do you deal when you see these sometimes when you see these things you might it will definitely affect you like uh, i was recently working on a, a, a mm. project where i had to watch a, a, a particular story of a of certain people group of people who are suffering and uh, it yeah. really disturbed my mind i had to work on the pro- video for many weeks mm-hmm. together how do you deal with this because when you go and see these things how do you as a person and not as a sociologist but as a person how do you deal with the stress because you your bp could shoot up or you could get a little yeah. how do you deal with these things in your experience? yeah thank you for asking me this question there have been uh, times when i have been greatly disturbed i keep thinking and thinking about it but because you are a human being first yes and then a sociologist next so it it bothers you it disturbs you because it exposes you to a reality which probably you know you might not have seen till then that is only one aspect the other thing is yes you also realize that as a student of sociology as somebody who has been uh, living in this society dealing with this teaching and writing you have to talk about that you have to tell people that this is happening and in my own you know a small little way because i don't think you can reform and change every sociologist can do that but in your own small way if you think that you can make a change you know this has been my life's mission if i may say so is that in your own small way even if it means changing the life of one individual you should try to first do that if there is a possibility and probability and room for my getting into the uh, picture i'll do that then second thing is i'll write about it i'll talk about it i'll talk about it in different platforms you know because i think we have when you have the yesterday this is what you know i was telling a group of uh, uh, students who are uh, appearing for a competitive exam and who will soon be teachers i said we have an audience before us we are the only group i said who have an audience before us at least for 8 to 10 months in the course of a year whereas mm-hmm. others you know it's only selective maybe politician maybe uh, art world in name any world you have certain events uh, organized when they come and speak i said but for all of us teachers you have people sitting before you at least for 8 to 10 months okay when classes are going on and this is your opportunity to talk to them and don't expect that if you have 100 students in the class all the 100 are going to start thinking differently or will change even if 10 to begin with start asking questions think differently and try to change at least one person or first try to change themselves or change at then go on changing one person that is the beginning of change that is the beginning of transformation mm-hmm. about which you know we are talking so much so mm-hmm. this is what i think i i have been doing you know try to talk not hesitate because most of the times you find most people especially academicians sitting on the fence i'll say this openly not taking a stand and i think not speaking or not reacting to a certain issue that has disturbed lives livelihoods of people is also wrong mm. not talking about it that yes. of course they may differ you know how can i talk about it i fa- i have been writing columns you know in uh, mm. um, newspapers canada newspapers for about the last 10 15 years i have of course got calls sometimes mm. Mm. from people because i I didn't hesitate to take names when an incident happened, and I wrote about it. Mm-hmm. So I have received calls, and I don't call them threats. I don't know why you wrote about this. You know how I've received from politicians, from many people, mm-hmm. who said, "See the way you hit us today. You know, I didn't think you would do that, uh, etc." Yeah. I said, "It's not hitting you. You know, I'm not doing this for you as an individual, but for me, what you did is an issue, and as a sociologist." i uh, yeah. you know have responded because i think it's my duty and i think that's what sociologists should do or oh, you will not get certain positions i'm sharing this with you you won't get into certain positions i said no i don't bother 
Mm. I, I honestly am not going to make compromises of any kind for the sake of positions. So mm. it's okay, you know, if you are not happy with me, once somebody called me, come, we're having a get together, we want you to come. I knew, I mm. guessed, you know, because I had written something about that group. Mm. I said, sorry. It's, all, it's, it's, it's interesting when, when you're talking about pushback from this power uh, quarters of society. Uh, I also want to know about the pushback from your students because uh, the younger generation is definitely fresh, new, and the mm, world they are living mm, in is very new. I was watching one of uh, one uh, uh, a lecture uh, and uh, it was like about a uh, thousand students in this big uh, auditorium. And uh, the, the professor was asking about, uh, gave a situation and uh, he asked, mm. uh, they were talking about uh, uh, justice. It was, it's a, it's a very wonderful, mm. wonderful uh, series on YouTube. You have justice series. I think it is okay. uh, by the Harvard University justice series. Oh, okay. It's mm. wonderful. Uh, so they are talking about cost benefit analysis. Uh, uh, com co co corporates have cost benefit analysis. So yeah. mm -hmm. they just threw this uh, one hypothetical situation where uh, you have to take a call as, uh, as a deciding authority. And uh, when I saw that many students were very, um, uh, had a soft corner for, uh, you know, and they took a uh, stance that was moral. You know, they okay. didn't, and mm. there were, but at the same time, equal number of them had a very different approach because they took a mm -hmm. very different stance. Yeah, if we have to, if uh, ten thousand lives need to be lost for humanity to progress in a certain way, that is correct. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So it was young people talking about it, and it was very interesting mm -hmm. to see uh, the Western society was much more like kind of very. Uh, uh, soft cornered, very soft hearted, but you know, people from students from Brazil, India, they were very, mm -hmm. very, very aggressive and very saying, yeah, that's how the world works, you know. So, yeah. uh, how do in your in your experience uh, the pushback that you're talking about? Mm -hmm. Have you? Uh, how is it in the student community? I must say that uh, in any group, I have to be very frank with you. Only a few people speak up. Okay. And it, it takes time to make them speak. And today, you know, after what you were listening to what you're telling me, I think that is the trend, you know, because this, this generation, yes. I suppose, is faced with bigger challenges. And for them, you know, it is their life that is more important. Yes. Uh, I now know that there are, in fact, one of the biggest challenges that our own discipline has is this. How do you relate it to life? Now tell me, you know, it's very nice to listen to all the ideology that you're uh, bringing into the lecture or your writing. Yeah. It's an ideal situation. Then, you know, in Kannada, there is a word called, you know, I, you, you, I, 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 I understand Kannada. When I say, I you know, Fote Thumbidauro. Oh, well, Fote I Thumbidauro. Not... Which means, then, you know, in Kannada, there is a word called Fote Thumbidauro. Oh, well, not... It means my stomach is filled. Okay. I, uh, you know, that means I have, uh, you know, the means and the resources to take care of myself. Okay. For me, hunger is not a problem. My future is not a problem. But when you're talking to these youngsters today, the first thing they would ask is, tell me what I'm going to get out of this. Mm whether it is sociology or economics or uh, journalism or whatever the discipline may be. So I have accepted that it is today, you know, very necessary for us as teachers, as writers, or whatever your profession may be, to convince this generation that they are going to get direct benefits because I see that the patience to wait has mm. almost gone now. Mm. And they started asking questions and I was telling you that this is one of the biggest challenges that sociology has. So as a teacher, I think it's very important. I don't know if this is the right answer to your question to convince how your discipline, how by sitting in this classroom, uh, it's going to help their lives. Otherwise, they sometimes will appear very cut and dry when they say, Tell me how this is going to be useful. 
Tell me why I should study this for three years or five years or seven years as the case may be, if I'm not going to get anything at the end of uh, this. So the biggest challenge comes, especially when you're dealing with students, is to convince them of the relevance of the discipline that you are trying to make them understand and follow and take. Because in many colleges, the admissions have completely, this is a reality. I think I, it's okay to talk about it. They have, with one of the disciplines, social sciences in general, have mm -hmm. received a beating today. And mm -hmm. sociology is one of the subjects, you know, that has um, tasted this very severely mm -hmm. because and I think the responsibility of convincing teachers, I will say this open, uh, sorry, students, lies with us teachers. Mm -hmm. Because the way in which you teach, the way in which you convey, the methodologies that you are adopting, and you know the new techniques that you bring into your classroom, these are very important. So I, will be, I believe that our you know, the entire process of reaching out to students has to change. So I do not really know whether everybody who listens to me, whether everybody who is sitting in a class or sitting in any other event where I'm part of or where many of us are part of, because being in the movement also, I have learned this lesson initially. You know, I used to get very angry when people asked questions. You know, sometimes those questions were not really not what should I say sensible they would irritate and then take such an anti-women stand that uh, would get very angry and shout but over a period of time I've realized may, you know maybe that person is asking because they he or she whoever is this doesn't know that there is an alternative so I have not learned to maintain calm. So can we ask this question? I said, yeah, please ask. I'll try and reply, try to understand. If you don't agree, then you say, enough, that's all. You know, your view is wrong uh, and you have to change it. So uh, the student group itself is a very diverse group. And one of the biggest challenges today for a teacher is to make students accept what you are talking or what you are writing, or what you are asking them to do is relevant to their lives. And that is why I believe that engaging them outside is very important. I, teach, I also teach you know, management uh, students. And the first thing I say is, have you taken a look outside your window and see what is going on there? And now, you know, because of these... Uh, uh, exposures they have in a very limited manner, of course, to the world outside. Many of them at least say, we didn't know that there was a world like this. Mm. We, we had no idea that people live like this and we were always complaining, unhappy. And now we realize that at least we have all these benefits in our life, which those people don't have. So I suppose that, well, that's <laughs> that's an area where a lot more work has to be done in our discipline and all teachers have to be convinced and they have to at least you know because you you are um, your life is made because of sociology i would say so you have something to give back to that discipline and to society where you tell students I don't mind whether one listens or one changes or 20 change. It's not for me one of numbers. But to tell them that this is life and this is what you can we can do. And for that, you have to do and show. You see, today gone are the days when there were only people who talked and did not practice mm -hmm. and they got away with it. But I think that to be in public domain, we must realize we are being watched. Mm. Every word that I write, every sentence that I write, I always, you know, think twice. Is this okay? Does this suit my temple? Yeah. Uh, my, sorry, my, the stand. And to the other, quickly reacting to the question, how, you know, like literature, films, etc. what difference can sociology make? I think but it's the same thing, you see. It's only by interacting. It's only by 
being constantly, we have now a paper, of course, I'll be very honest with you, which has been introduced in sociology in many universities and colleges called sociology of the media. Mm. We, we have a course like that. Why was it introduced? Because the media is so important. Making today. a huge, but, has a huge impact. Yeah, it has, but except in a few places, there is no interaction between people from the media and the students, whether films or uh, theater or, uh, you know, print journalism, all those things. So, um, and they say, who is teaching this? Many people, sociology teachers, who honestly, I'll tell you, have no exposure to this. So mm -hmm. unless you open up your teaching learning process to people from diverse backgrounds, I think that sociology will not, you know, will not go ahead. This is mm. my firm opinion on that. See, because you should, you should let students see the world. That is one thing. World, the lived in realities. The other thing is open up classrooms to people drawn from different backgrounds. Come and share their experiences. Let students ask. Many places are doing this also. But I must tell you that where but many universities, the typical, uh, you know, stereotypical uh, universities and colleges, as I call them, are not doing this. And that is one of the, that's what is damaging our discipline. So unless teachers are and institutions are ready to open up their minds, you should have people from literature, people from media, people from um, you know, different disciplines, economics, political science, governance, public administration, come and talk to them, engage them in interactions. You know, I don't think much headway will be done. Yeah. So I, wherever yeah. it is possible, we have to do that. Yeah. I, I also was, uh, uh, want to bring your attention, maybe you can talk something about yeah. it, because uh, one is, when we, uh, in, an, in normal everyday life, it is, uh, or a person who was born and raised in a city environment, uh, it's very difficult for them to go to a remote area and see how yeah. people live there in a desert or a forest or, um, uh, or fish, fishing communities and uh, farming okay. communities. One is that. Okay. At the same yeah. time, as, as, as time progresses, there are new societies being involved, like sub-societies, for example, single mothers or, yeah. you know, mm. corporate employees, corporate slaves or whatever yes. you call them. Mm. You know, these are also societies. So uh, if you can talk about how since you're talking about the future of sociology and there's more to learn, there is never ending. There is, it is never ending yeah. because everything is starting new. So how do you think, uh, what, what do you think would be the right or should sociologists, teachers and sociologists uh, do for these new communities that are coming up and what kind of observations and what, how should they start interacting with these things and bring, uh, new truths to life to to the public if you can talk about it like talk about new these, writing about speaking about these new groups starting with we... starting with observe observing first of all i mean i don't think it's a question it's just a thought yeah. because i'm okay. i'm thinking of these yeah. new like for example uh, when i worked in uh, the corporate like we were we for, we saw ourselves as one people of one world you know we are mm -hmm. all people of the corporate world and we have our own okay. problems yeah yeah right 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 so uh, are there any studies or uh, if there are no studies, um, have you thought about it? What are your thoughts about these new societies and how to deal with that and how, what are your observations? Sure. Okay, about the new, new societies or new groups that are emerging. Yeah. That's what I said, sociology, I think the first thing I said is to be, on the con to be constantly on the lookout, mm. to be able to search because I think that the uh, one quality that, we have to develop if we have to be, you know, sociologists who can make some difference to life mm -hmm. as well as to the academic world is to think differently, to keep on observing and looking. So talking about, I'll talk about this later, but they're talking about the corporate world. I think now the corporate, in fact, we have a branch of sociology called corporate sociology, sociology of the market, mm -hmm. sociology of... Uh, uh, you know, organizations, 
Mm. All these are already there. But what I think is now the corporate world, it's our responsibility to go and get into those worlds. Mm -hmm. See, one thing that sociology must do is to go and, you know, make those, uh, take those breaks, as I call, I would like to call them. Because often we also tend to shut ourselves in very closed, uh, you know, domains. Now the corporate world has also realized that it's not just about money, finance, uh, uh, profits, and that CSR is not just, you know, meaningless charity where you say, all right, give 2%, give 1%. Because I'm part of, in, you know, institution where I'm on the BOG, the, where we talk a lot about these things. And I've always been talking about bringing in the social science perspective into management. Now they're talking a lot about introducing what is called, for example, one example, ecologically sustainable governance mm -hmm. is an area where the corporate world, you know, wants to get involved in a big way and bring this into the curriculum of management uh, programs. So likewise, you know, I myself uh, talk about uh, what is called Indian society in transition to students of management. In fact, we offered it as a special uh, course a couple of years ago. But the first introduction that they get to lived realities is through this series of lectures on what Indian society is about and what they should do. And then also it's important to challenge them. I think sociology must challenge the corporate world by saying that life is not only about profits and uh, uh, you know, sharing uh, resources. You or it's not talking about uh, what you call as uh, one percent or six percent of the people having control over seventy-five percent of the resources in this country, and the rest of them having to struggle. So introducing the corporate world to realities, and I frankly, you know, will uh, tell you that students nowadays are thinking. Mm. It is not that uh, they, they are insensitive to this. Probably mm. it's important to talk to them. Mm. And for that corporate world or the education which is preparing them to get into this corporate world must open up to creating spaces for these young students to be exposed to ground level realities. It, it need not be you know, hitting on their head all the time. You see, like in a um, course that has just opened up and I was talking to, I told the students, I know the pressures that are there on you to achieve grades, placements, mm. but take only 15 minutes, I said, only mm. 15 minutes in a, a day mm. to think about what is going on outside. Just go outside, you know, walk. You live in a very comfortable zone, but just go in the street take a walk from this end to that end and meet people and you will understand you know what life is about and start mm. thinking about them and what you can do to them to make some difference it's not just about you know giving money and uh, let them do what they want but think of how they may be living think of what you have that they don't have before starting to complain that you know you should have had this you should have had that so this is one way in which i think sociology can reach the corporate world and talking about single mothers or the lgbtq community mm. i always tell you know whenever i speak of gender it's not just gender but genders mm. and i say gender is not a binary of male and female only mm. you we have people who who have the freedom who must have the freedom to have their sexual orientation, decide what they want to be. And so I always say, whenever, you know, we see them in traffic signals, et cetera, what do most people do? Shut the window if you are sitting in a car, you know, it's very easy for you to shut your window and then just shoo them away. But mm. think of their life. Think of their life. And why do they have to beg? Why do they have to you know, come and do this. Have you gone beyond this uh, appearance which they put in, in the street, the way they live in the slums, the kind of corrupt world in which they are involved? So I think that first what sociology must do is to, imp it's important 
to change its curriculum our content mm. must be more related to life i'm not saying don't talk of theory don't talk of uh, all those uh, you know galaxy of uh, theoreticians who have contributed to our discipline but bring in more practice mm. bring in more uh, uh, you know opportunities for them to understand this world so i think in every we are fighting for this one of our own uh, um you know dreams and desires has been that sociology must be brought into every branch of study we did it in commerce you know we are fighting i'm i'm using the word fighting consciously mm. to uh, for that question that you asked so so that when we bring this into all disciplines people at least student will realize mm. and when you say single mothers or you know increasing uh, divorce where has it increased i think that single mothers if uh, you know uh, i may i i have a feeling they have always been there mm -hmm. today you are talking about it desertion uh, separation violence all those have been there in this society mm -hmm. of ours for centuries but for violence to come into the public domain you know for domestic violence to come into the public domain for uh, uh separation and all those issues that we are dealing with it took time actually it's the autonomous women's movement that did did it so uh you will see that uh, sociology and many other even gender studies for that matter to me it's not just i always have said you know i i will I, you know, just take one second to quote this even in the 80s you know there is a committee that was set up by indian council for social sciences research to look into this uh, uh, the whole uh, plethora of uh, proposals that came in uh, gender studies for grant so one of the members of that committee said see we all th those days we already mm. have two genders you know men mm. and women so mm. don't create a third gender called phds and mphils in women mm. studies mm. because what we want to look for are people with commitment see unfortunately there is no commitment that is expected from us you you work on domestic help you work on single mothers you work on uh, lgbtq you work on slum dwellers you work on uh, women who have suffered violence but how what is the kind of social commitment you can insist see that should come from the heart that's why i said when your discipline becomes your passion then only you can do that for me sociology is my passion in fact there are people who always ask me why is it you know you are always seeing sociology in everything can't you be happy can't you just you know mm. relax separate your work and your separate your work yeah. and your why do you do that all the time I, but that, yes yeah. somehow that, it's got into my life and i ask so i suppose that can i don't i don't know whether i'm answering the question that you asked me but the thing is it is also it it's kind of mutual i would say those all other areas to recognize the importance of sociology and i think that movement has already started to be very honest and also for sociology to realize that we need to bring in perspectives of other disciplines into our discipline uh, if both should happen simultaneously and i think the process has begun at least i would i think say all, all the right thinking people have realized that it is important for sociology to uh, be involved in other areas of life and also sociologists have realized that it is important to come out of those blocks you know and do some out of the box thinking to bring in all disciplines into our own discipline and your that's how you help students to strengthen their abilities your in your uh, uh, series lecture series you were talking about yeah. research i and of course uh, uh, when you are involved at this level you do a lot of research and yeah. uh, hmm. so and just we were talking about how you are not able, i mean you are so involved that people ask you why are, why are you a sociologist 24 bar 7 so hmm. uh, the next thing that uh, you can talk about is um, practical tips on how to keep balance especially for students be it part of our discipline yeah. you know like as a, a you yeah. you've been teaching for 50 years so how many hours have you spent in research and then you had your personal life then you had teaching and so if you can give us practical tips if you can give us some tips and how to not 
tip over and you know how do you manage your research when you talk about when you talk about the importance of research uh, what quality of mind mental quality state that one has to bring to the research and how to keep it balanced if you can provide some tips uh, as a yeah. this is yeah. not a sociology question this is as a sociologist as a active uh, yeah uh, and practitioner yeah. yeah okay okay yeah sure thank you for asking me that question see initially you know i if i can talk of myself and for most people it may be like that when you get into research it is for getting your degree mm. phd you know because that's part of the way you grow in your discipline and there are all those uh, necessities that are part of it so initially when i my my phd was on engineering education my support okay. my teacher yeah my guide yeah. she said wanted me to work on that and my first question engineering and sociology i was very young then and she was angry with me she said no you have to do go and find ways of why it is important for a sociologist to yeah. work on that for me engineering education at that point of my life was only about you know i thought that it is only in engineering colleges we had a college just located in our campus we would see students it didn't go beyond that but when you know i started working on that i realized that engineering education is not just about learning technology there are questions that a sociologist a sociology student has to ask who gets access to engineering education what are the groups and that was also the time you know 1980s when a lot of expansion in uh, private institutions was uh, taking place so i i asked many questions who has this growth affected who are the groups that have got in uh, you know got an advantage out of this expansion especially in the private sector so that's how i went on but my commitment to research started when i started getting involved in projects one of the first projects i did was that was in the field of media you know looking at uh, advertisements on programs in regional television channels those days you know in the late 80s there were in early 90s there were in too many channels so when we started looking at media programs from a gender angle i realized that there are many issues which as a student of sociology i, I can point out but my real involvement with people i would say started when i started working with forest dependent communities in research projects you know looking at forestry programs etc uh then in 19 late 1990s i got an opportunity to work on fellowships from the shastri indo canadian institute where i had a canadian research partner professor karim malik assam who was then in university of calgary he and i together started working on the role of first our first project was on the role of women in forestry programs and so it was a i wouldn't call it a completely comparative study but karim already had started working with indigenous communities in uh, northwest territories in uh, canada and i started my work in uh, the joeda region of uttar kannada district in karnataka you know where the joint forest planning and management program was first introduced so the forestry programs were there and the program was based on this concept of participatory forestry where for the first time you involved people in forest management so we started working together and we decided that we going to locate or we will concentrate all our research projects in future here mm -hmm. and it was from karim that you know i got uh, close to this concept and practice of participatory research this is what i would tell all those who want to because it's not just about the researcher deciding on a topic which usually happens in 90% of the cases and then go to the field or use data that are already available and write up but we decided and from karim you know he had, they had used that uh, methodology very effectively in their study of indigenous communities in canada when you involve the people generally we don't ask you know whether our research has any meaning for them we take it for granted that well 
you know, I'm doing a favor, many people think. No. So I would say, just as it may be important for me to undertake that research for whatever the purpose may be, as a researcher, it's also very necessary for me to go talk to the people in the field, ask them what they want me to do. We did this, you know, say we have got this opportunity to work with forest communities and this is where we want to uh, place our research. Is it all right with you? Give, you know, help us, support us. But also there are questions, are there any questions which you want us to ask mm -hmm. in our research? You were talking because about one of the maps in Canada, in the, the map that you created. The map. No, the, the infrastructure profile of the region yeah. which we region, created. Yeah, that's a brilliant project. So in one of the meeting, yeah, in one of the meetings, you know, one teacher said, if you have the provision, why don't you tell us what we have and what we don't have? Mm. I believe that research becomes relevant when it gives people the power mm. to take control of their lives. So mm. we start, we created this uh, infrastructure profile. Mm. In fact, somebody might have, why, why do you require a sociologist to do that? You know, schools, roads, uh, mm. all those things. But then sociologists are required because they ask the question, mm. why is the road important? Why is the location of a school important, etc. So we started talking to people. We involved them in our work. You know, this whole process of uh, documenting uh, infrastructure was done by the local people. So for the first time from my uh, partner, Kareem, I heard the word community researcher. Mm -hmm. See, in India, that was something we never, ever do. Because if you have to take a, we, the words like research assistant, research associate, etc., you know, we have to appoint them only based on certain guidelines masters, PhD, MPhil, et cetera. But for the first time, we heard this word community researcher. So I saw also in Canada, uh, you know, he had taken me to Hay River is the place where they were doing the work. So women from the local communities were part of the research process. So I think that one of the, if I may say, if I may say what, I'm, what is my tip, what is my suggestion is it's important to involve the community, not just as your subjects or objects, but as participants who can give you very useful critical insights. Because in the long run, your research must be shared with them. In fact, they were, my Canadian uh, partners were talking of community ownership of research, mm -hmm. where you hand over the findings to them mm -hmm. and they own the research. So that we, we started following uh, this path of involving the local people and uh, telling them, how is this research going to be useful to you? So mm -hmm. looking at research from the perspective of the participants, calling them participants in the first place, and also trying to tell them and uh, trying to find out how this is useful. Mm -hmm. So that is what I would say researchers in social sciences in general must do. Because ultimately, the information, they are not just information givers for us. So that is one thing I would say. And validate your findings at every point. That is what we did, you know. We validated our findings. And uh, if the community is con convinced, because initially I had opposition. I have almost got beaten because they didn't like the whole idea of working on women, etc. But over a period of time, you know, they they became our partners. Even to this day, the relationship continues. Mm. And so make convincing the people with whom you are working that your research is important for them, mm. that it's going to make some sense to their lives is a big challenge for a social science researcher. And that's what we must try and do. That 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 is what I would tell researchers. Instead of just looking at them as your subjects yeah give a, they give you information you have a questionnaire go and ask even in the formulation of research questions involving the persons who will participate in the research is very important so what and sharing your findings with yep. them yep. write it in a language that they are familiar with because that knowledge must become power to them Thank you. Thank That's you, Professor. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was it was a pleasure. My yeah. pleasure. Thank you so yeah. much for giving yeah. me this opportunity to talk. Yeah. A conversation with Professor Ramarao showed us the ability of sociology to ask difficult questions. It also showed us 
sociology's potential as a discipline to guide other disciplines into newer directions. It would be wonderful to know your thoughts on the conversation and if it inspired your world view in any way. Thanks for being here. I will see you soon with another interesting mind, we must define another interesting subject. Until then, take care.